Hello friends and welcome back to episode number 28 of my 31 day challenge where every single day I'm answering your questions about creating a career or a business that you love. And in today's episode, we're on the final stretch now, today's episode we're talking about how do you make VR training. So I'll be diving into all of that. If you've got a question for these last kind of few episodes of the 31 day challenge, then you can ask me over on social media, Alex Makes VR. If you've got a slightly longer question, you can ask it on email, alexmakesvr at gmail.com. And every single day I'm sending out a daily newsletter, very short, concise email, just to give you the inside scoop of the tips and the tricks that I divulge in these episodes. Divulge such like a sultry word, isn't it? Divulge, all the scoop. Anyway, you can sign up for that newsletter, alexmakesvr.com. So how do you make VR training? Well, for the sake of this episode, I'm going to assume that what you want to do is you want to get client commissions to create VR training rather than build your own and then try and sell it into companies retrospectively. Um, or So for example, you could, if you wanted to build a VR training experience, whether that be 360 or game engine, and then sell it into a company and it becomes a product, which is a brilliant way to go if you can, but it's, it's a slightly different process to getting a commission. For the sake of this episode, I'm gonna focus on how do you go about making VR training um, from the start, like how do you, who's the people that you need to get in touch with and then what that process might look like um, and how it fits into the bigger picture. So firstly though, the benefits of doing VR training. So training is one of the biggest areas that VR is seeing massive adoption. Uh, In the PwC report, Seeing is Believing, which is all about the economic impact that the VR and AR industries are going to have on the global economy. I can't remember exactly the percentage, but a large percentage of the adoption of VR and AR technology is in the L&D sector, which is the learning and development uh, sector. And the beauty of that is that pretty much every organisation has, well, full stop, I think 99.9% of companies will have some kind of training. And the the whole idea of training is to save a company time and money. It's to make sure that their employees are up to speed on certain practices. It might be getting them introduced or inducted into certain skill sets. It might also be some kind of training that helps advance their skills. It might be um, preventative training to to safeguard um, the company from having to pay out for accidents and things like that. There's so many different areas within training, obviously, which is why it's such a brilliant sector to kind of get into. And the reason why VR is flourishing in that is because it's a new innovative way to uh, engage employees. It's something totally new, a bit like when kind of interactive video training became a thing like a couple of decades ago well, probably not a couple of decades ago, maybe one decade ago. Um, And then that became the gold standard because it became this new way and like people were seeing their employees, like uh, retention rates go up and um, they were finding that people were enjoying training rather than being bored to tears. And so companies do really put a lot of effort into into finding training that really works. And there's some massive companies that have adopted VR training and are seeing tremendous results. The biggest one that I know of is probably Walmart. If you just Google Walmart VR training, you'll see some phenomenal uh, studies and um, statistics around them rolling out. I think it's something like 3,000 VR headsets across their American stores. One of the most touching, I think, uh, articles I ever read about VR training was the CEO of Walmart saying that VR training had saved lives in Las Ve- I think it was Las Vegas. Or was it te- Texas? I can't remember. There was basically an active shooter situation where, uh, I think it was last year, 2019, someone went into a Walmart and just started shooting people. And um, the CEO of Walmart said that thanks to a VR training simulation that they had, which was showing uh, their co- uh, their employees how to handle and what to do and how to respond in an active shooter situation. Thanks to that training, 
those employees were as prepared as they could have been for that particular um that particular experience that tragic horrible you know position that they were put in and that training led to people say like saving lives basically the ceo said that that training experience saved lives because people were more prepared and had felt almost like they'd already been through the experience because of the fact they'd done vr training and obviously one of the ben- huge benefits of vr is feeling like you've actually experienced something it goes from you know just watching something to actually doing something so that's obviously just a very, very apt and amazing example of just how beneficial VR training can be. But it is an area where a lot of people are willing to take a risk on uh, on trying something new. So, so obviously, there's tons of other benefits for why a company might want VR training. But uh, when it comes to like practical advice, like how do you go about actually making it? Well, the first thing you need to do is to reach out to some companies um, and get in touch with either their head of L&D, so head of learning and development, or or they might be called just head of training in some organisations. But learning and development seems to be the key title of these people. Um, or even like head of um, HR, human resources, because they themselves will also oversee um or they will have influence and decision-making power about the kind of training that gets rolled out in companies. Uh, and if it's a smaller company, even maybe going directly to the managing director or the, the, the person that runs the CEO, the person that runs the company. Um, and you really want to basically find out what areas of training they currently have that could use some um, innovation, that could use some, um, you know, some, what's the word? updating I guess is the is like the simplest way to put it I guess um so you want to look at what areas of training they're really focused on at the moment a huge section of the training um that I'm seeing being commissioned is around unconscious bias so obviously there is a lot of conversation especially since um, the George Floyd murder like there's a huge resurgence of of companies looking at how do we make change from the ground up in our organisations? How do we educate our employees about unconscious bias? How do we make sure that we are making sure that that our workplace reflects the values that we want the wider society to have, which is that everyone should have equal opportunity and everyone um, should be respected and feel safe and feel heard in their place of work. So unconscious bias training is a massive one. You've got things like safety and awareness training. That's like a huge, that's like a huge kind of, um, subsection of training. And these are uh, the ones I'm touching on here are ones that I specialize in and, and tend to do a lot of work in. Um, so you've got safety and awareness. You've also got things like induction training. So you could have, something as simple as like a tour of the offices pointing out fire exits that kind of thing so you've got induction training what else you got you got leadership training um looking at how uh well you could either look at the side of like um how to promote good leadership what some examples of that are you could have like a training simulation where someone's practicing um and getting training on how to uh how to communicate better with uh their juniors or team members or whatever it might be so so many different areas of training so the first thing you want to do reach out to those people in those positions of power find out what kind of training they already have often vr training will be part of a much bigger training puzzle so just like a training video would be part of a wider training program it might be that there's a kind of an online course that they have to do afterwards to make sure that they've retained information or it might be that there's like a practical exam they have to do afterwards or whatever it might be it might even just be part of like a bigger workshop where people are discussing things like unconscious bias whatever it might be find out what the bigger puzzle piece looks like uh, figure out what the puzzle looks like and then work out how the vr training can kind of be a puzzle piece that fits into that don't just go in guns blazing and kind of think about, uh, you know, thinking about like just trying to push. Oh, it's like 
it's VR training simulation that does X, Y, Z and it stands alone and it's, you know, tries to do everything. Often that's not what people want. They want it to be this piece where it's it's a very important piece that engages and is something new and exciting, but then it follow is followed by something else. And that's quite important, understanding how the VR training fits into the bigger context of um, the overall training strategy of the company. So once you've got a good sense of that, then you can start to look at, well, what are the ways that you maybe want to deliver that VR training? So it could be um, a linear narrative, uh, narrative, narrative driven experience, which, so that's what I specialize in. I specialize in cats not peas in general in recent years has become specialists in immersive storytelling so we do that regardless of whether it's an original drama or a piece of training we put drama and characters at the heart of of that and I do that personally because I believe that um, emotional impact and stories stay with people way longer than just a fire safety video where someone points out you know these are the facts and the figures like that doesn't that's not very engaging. That's not, that's not necessarily anything new. So the power of VR is that you can put people in these situations that they wouldn't necessarily be in, or they would, they would never have thought to have put themselves into someone else's shoes and actually physically see what it's like to see their worldview or, um, be put in a position where they have to learn how to put out a fire because it's literally blazing right next to them. So you can do like, very new and innovative things with VR training that you couldn't do with traditional mediums. And I think you need to lean into that, lean into what's different about VR compared to traditional video or interactive training. Um, so I tend to do character driven things. So I'll, I'll put you in like a, in, in a scenario and it'll be almost like a role play, but usually, uh, on a bit of a grander scale. So, I've done several. One of my favourite by far that I've ever done with a company was a massive cyber security training piece where you got to experience what it was like to go through um, a crisis where a massive company had been hacked and you got to, you know, you got to kind of experience that firsthand as a few different characters. Um, so that was really interesting and fun. It was a fun way of tackling what could potentially be quite a dry subject, which is cybersecurity. So um, there's loads of different ways you could go about it. Uh, the easiest one is obviously just kind of looking at things that um, like practical things like, for example, hazard awareness training. If, if say, you could approach a construction site and say, hey, I could probably save you money on um, accidents that happen on the construction site by replacing your current training with a VR simulation where they step onto a construction site and they have to like spot all of the hazards or they see something play out, um, you know, like a, an accident play out and that might kind of like stay with them a bit more than just watching it on a video, all those kind of things. Have a think about that. I obviously specialise mainly in um, 360 film and interactive uh, narrative experiences, but you could also do like pure kind of like gamified VR training. That could That's absolutely got a place in the world, um, but you could also go straight linear narrative like with a 360 camera and just kind of uh, treating the camera as if they are an employee of the company going through a particular experience. So there's loads of different ways that you can physically go about creating uh, VR training and that, and then you just kind of go down the same rabbit hole as you would if you were doing any other 360 production. And of course, if you're stepping up from going from purely 360 photos and virtual tours to 360 training, then you know, that di the difference in production is obviously quite vast. So you definitely want to get some experience in 360 video and looking at that process. How do you work with actors? How do you, um, one of the biggest things I would say is make sure that you understand at the heart of the VR training, what the company wants their employees to feel when they take the headset off. What do they want them to remember? What are the key things that this VR training needs to, um, needs to pinpoint? Because often I see people, again, they, they run in and they're very excitable because it's, it's quite creative and cool to make um, 
certain VR training projects and then they just like go, oh, okay, I'm just going to do all of this crazy stuff just because I can. And I know, you know, I, I know that I can have a 360 camera flying around on a drone and that would be really cool. But it actually has, n it has no, no place in that VR training, you know, because actually the piece is all about, I don't know, <laughs> understanding where the fire exits are, for example, in a warehouse. Like, so just make sure that you are really listening to your client listening about what the big key pieces are that need to be factored in I would always 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 work with the client to develop a storyboard first um develop a storyboard which says in detail what is going to happen in the experience I tend to write my storyboards as if I am the user in a headset so I will refer to and I can if it's interesting I can do a whole episode on the way I go about storyboard and scripting projects uh, but it's so important especially when you work with clients that you really iron out all of the details of the piece before you get your camera out or before you start to work in unity you have to understand and you have to get the client to sign off everything before you start because it's a very expensive problem to have if you've kind of just start filming stuff and they go oh hang on a second no I don't like that I want it to be from that point of view or I want it to do that whereas when you do a storyboard beforehand and you're writing it from the point of view of what the person in the headset is seeing so um so an example might be I don't know let's say let's say it's a it's a it's a leadership training um yeah, it's a leadership training piece. Uh, so it might be that the first scene is I want to establish that we are uh, a manager in this scene. So maybe the storyboard is, you know, scene number one. Um, we are uh, we are Sarah, uh, a manager at a bank, and we are uh, we are seeing that we've had a problem with a couple of team members and and they're not getting on and that's causing a problem and meaning we're, we're losing work in our team so what we're actually so that's the context of the scene that's what we're going to learn in that scene and then how might we learn that so maybe we have so maybe we're sat in our office and then we start to get into the detail right so that's like we're Sarah um, and we can see our body uh, but we are the point of view of Sarah we're in our office and one of our uh, junior team members comes in a bit upset and says, you know, is it OK if we if if I um, go home early? I don't know. This is a really terrible example. But you know, what I mean, you start to describe what's actually going to happen in that scene, because then you can really quickly ascertain from the client whether or not that is something that they want or whether they're like, no, that's totally wrong. That wouldn't happen or that's not the environment they would be in they would be in somewhere like this or you can really start to iron out those details before you start to do anything that's going to incur cost because again I've seen it happen time and time again people <laughs> running before they walk not getting stuff signed off from the client not talking them through all the implications of all the creative decisions they're making that's a big one actually when it's like yeah let's have them do this and then they like run into the room and they have to trip over a wire and stuff and then you go okay uh I mean technically that's possible but if we were to do that what we would need is we would well we would probably need to consider health and safety in terms of like from an actor's standpoint we want the actor to be safe so we probably have to bring in someone whose whole job it is is to like safeguard that actor and and train them to fall correctly or make sure we get a, an actor that is comfortable with that get them to sign release form blah 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 we would have to have extra rehearsal time for that we would have to have a head mounted ca uh, camera if it was being filmed in 360 like so um it wouldn't be as simple as just you know and then like the user might feel sick if they're seeing that point of view and they've never used VR before and you're all of a sudden having the character run in and trip over and the the post-production on that's going to be a bit of a nightmare because we'd ha we'd have to film that scene with um pretty much no post-production needed because otherwise it's going to be a nightmare because it's a moving shot and we would have to you know, uh, comp every single frame of that and it would be very difficult rather than just um, 
with a static shot, it's much easier to play out the crew and the lighting and that kind of thing. So all of a sudden, when you start to like look at the big implications of every single creative decision, then you can say you can kind of very quickly uh, get to a place with the client where they're like, oh, okay, that makes sense. So we want to communicate that the wire was there and they shouldn't trip on it but we want to do it in a way that is budget friendly so how can we go about that okay well maybe maybe we have another character come in the scene and trip over it and we're like sat at our desk so we're very static that's budget more budget friendly and more friendly to a vr user that's never used vr before we're still getting the point we're still seeing something um happen um it still feels, you know, uh, again, that is terrible off the head, off the top of the head example, but looking at those kind of things. So make sure you're, make sure you're overly communicating with the client, because as soon as you work on a 360 video project versus a photo project, and as soon as you start having to work with um, bigger teams, or even if it's just, even if in that scenario, you're using the a company's employees as the actors there's so many things that go into it as soon as more people start getting involved it starts to get a bit more complicated so just make sure that you're really really talking through with the client and really make sure you get that sign off every step of the way and then obviously you create the piece it's wonderful yay yay everyone's happy and then you have to help the client with the rollout because obviously with VR training it's not just as simple as cool there's your mp4 off you go you will have to kind of maybe include in your price the idea of training them in the VR headset so that they know how to use them and how to implement them properly. You'll maybe have to offer them a little bit of support when they start to roll out, maybe even being there for the first session where they use it with their employees, um, teaching them. Maybe it needs to be kind of, maybe the training needs to be baked into an app so that they can have like a synced sync training session or are they going to let the employees use it on their own in their own time in which case maybe you need to develop like a manual that goes along with it to say this is how you turn on the headset choose this app run this video if you know if, if a problem occurs with this this is how you do it because remember as well people generally most people have not had a lot of experience with vr headsets so even something as simple as navigating the menu can be a real difficulty so um, it's thinking about that piece as well and making sure that the client can actually implement it okay and can actually use it as part of their training um, because the worst is when you deliver something but then they never use it because they don't understand or they haven't thought through the actual the actual technical implications of having to use VR in training so um, that's something to consider as well. Okay I think I think this is a good place to stop. Touched on quite a bit there. So hopefully that's a good starting point for how you go about making VR training and things to consider. Again, if you'd be interested uh, in me breaking down some of the processes behind that, even just like looking at the production process in general and tips and tricks, let me know. You can, um, yeah, you can ask me a question or or, or let me know about those kind of um subjects if that would be interesting on social media you can uh you shoot me a dm or a comment or whatever on uh, instagram and twitter i'm alex makes vr on both those platforms if you've got a longer piece of follow-up you can send me an email alex makes vr at gmail.com and every single day i'm putting out these newsletters just to to give you the inside scoop and some tips and tricks that i discuss in the episode you can sign up for that newsletter at alex makes vr.com and with that being said I guess I'll speak to you tomorrow.